my big question is what is the relationship between language and thought? We can think about this in a slightly different way and ask how are language and thought connected exactly? Do concepts arise independent of language experience um, or does language help structure our concepts in the first place? And what happens if we speak different languages? Do speakers of different languages think in the same way or do they think differently in line with what their language does? There's different, very different points of view about these big questions. So on the one hand, we have scholars that think that concepts are mostly innate and universal. So one representative of this kind of view might be Noam Chomsky, who's argued the linkage of concept and sound can be acquired on minimal evidence, the possible sounds are narrowly constrained, and the concepts may be virtually fixed. Similarly, Elizabeth Spelke, a developmental psychologist, has argued that studies in the history of science and in science education suggest that initial knowledge can be displaced, revised and overturned as new knowledge is acquired. But she suggests, in contrast, that initial knowledge is central to common sense reasoning throughout development, suggesting the knowledge that the infant brings to the world stays there, shaping how they experience the world, whatever linguistic or cultural experience they might have had. Now, proponents of this view often appeal to certain types of evidence. So in particular, they look at um, the foundations of thought by studying infants, or they might rely on comparative co cognitive evidence from studies across different species. If we look at what infants bring to learning, we can see even before they've started to acquire the words and grammar of their language, they show rich conceptual structure. So in some studies that we've done in my lab, we've shown that by nine month olds, babies already distinguish blue, green and purple. And that's way ahead of when they've learned the words in their particular language. Similarly, we can see that pre-linguistic babies show evidence of cross-modal associations. So they link different types of pitches with places in space. And that's interesting because in English, we talk about pitches in terms of space. We refer to high versus low pitches. If we test four-month-old babies by showing them videos of a ball moving up and down in space while a sound is playing, we can see that they're sensitive to these sorts of associations. So in this first video, you'll see a ball moving up and down while the pitch is congruent with the movement. In the second video, you'll see a ball moving up and down while the sound is incongruent with the movement. So these videos can be played to babies and we can measure how long they look at these videos if they're playing con played continuously in a loop. And what we find is that four month old babies, in fact, even 44 hour old babies, show a preference for those audio and spatial stimuli that are congruent with one another, suggesting that very early, maybe even when they're born, infants are sensitive to these sound space associations. A very different perspective on the relationship between language and thought comes from scholars who um, hold that concepts in language vary widely since they are molded to fit local preoccupations. So representatives of this view are people like Nick Evans and Steve Levinson, who've argued that languages differ fundamentally from each other on every level of description, sound, grammar, lexicon, meaning, that it's very hard to find any single structural property that they share. So from this perspective, people, um, researchers uh, are um, focused primarily on cross-cultural evidence, and they examine the foundations of thoughts by studying people from different cultures. So we know that there's around 6,500 languages spoken in the world today, 
And if we look at the lexical variation in these languages, we find bits to the local cultural preoccupations. So many pastoralist societies of East Africa, for example, have impressively large lexicons referring to cattle, patterns and colours. Hopi terms uh, for corn have been documented in the 1960s. So indigenous corn didn't just come in yellow, but there were distinct terms to refer to corn, orange corn with white stripes or blue corn, red corn, different types of corn. And in the same way, you've probably heard about words for snow. Well, maybe not words of snow in Scottish. Um, a few years ago, a Scottish artist, Arthur Waitson and colleagues, made a public art project where they compiled uh, words for snow in English, Scots and Gaelic. And in, these, um, uh, in this lexicon, you find things like fuchter, which is uh, a slight fall of snow, or blindrift, which is a sharp, blinding, driving snow. So maybe it's not surprising to find that in different parts of the world, you'll find ways of talking about things that are culturally important. But perhaps what we care more about is how um, different languages carve up shared experiences. So things that we all experience. Are they packaged in the same way because we all experience them in the same way? Or do we find variation there too? So if we do look at basic vocabulary, we find similar variation across the world's languages. So let's take parts for the body. In English, we distinguish the hand and the arm with the distinct terms. But if you speak Russian or Indonesian, then there's a single term that covers the and and the arm. If you speak Labukalave on the Solomon Islands, then you don't even distinguish the arm and the leg. There's just one term, tau. That's a basic term to refer to the limbs, I guess. Similarly, if we look at words for ingestion, in English, we distinguish eat smoke and drink, solid things, liquid things, smoky things that we're able to ingest. But if you speak Punjabi, then you only distinguish two. You eat, ka, but smoking and drinking are lexicalized together under a single term, bi. And if you speak jahai, well, there's not even a general verb for eating. You have to distinguish whether you're eating a starchy thing, gay, a meaty thing, much, a leafy thing, q, or a fruity thing, but. So you can't just say that you had something, you ate something for dinner. You have to specify exactly what sort of thing because there's no generic verb. Wherever we look at whatever part of the lexicon, we find similar variation. Be it everyday events, body parts, landscape, small scale spatial relations, temporal relations, emotions, perceptions, similar variation turns up in the languages of the world again and again. And that raises that question again of whether these different ways of talking about the world affect how people think about the world too. So as one example of this, let's go back to those cross-modal associations that we found in babies. So I said in English, we talk about pitch in terms of high versus low, but not all languages do this. Some languages use a different spatial metaphor Instead of talking about high, low pitches, they talk about thin versus thick pitches instead. So we can ask whether these different ways of talking about pitch affect how people think about pitch. So to test this, um, we compared Dutch speakers who, like English, use a high, low metaphor for sounds to Farsi speakers who use a thin, thick metaphor instead. So we brought them into the lab and we played them sounds, a single tone, while they saw a line on the screen. So they heard the tone um, while they saw an irrelevant spatial stimulus. Then they received a prompt and they had to sing back the tone that they heard. So if you uh, look at the sound that they heard versus the sound that they reproduced when they sang, you'll find a strong relationship between the pitch that they heard another pitch that they reproduce. So it might not be absolutely the same value, but the relative pitch increases in relation to the sound that they've heard. But we're not really interested in that. What we want to know is what happens to their singing when they see an irrelevant spatial stimulus. 
And the spatial stimuli that we show them are lines that appear in different heights on the screen, or they're lines that appear in different thicknesses on the screen. So we can ask whether the different heights and the different thicknesses affect how people sing back the same note. And what we find is that Dutch speakers sing back the same note higher when they see a line high on the screen than when it's low on the screen. But for Farsi speakers, that makes no difference. Instead, for Farsi speakers, they sing back the same note higher when they see a line that's thin versus a line that's thick. But for the Dutch speakers, that makes no difference. So what that tells us is these different ways of talking about sounds affects how people think about sounds, even when they're not using language. A slightly different question we can ask are, are whether there are things that language cannot express. Are there concepts that defy linguistic coding? And what might that tell us about the nature of thoughts anyway? One place where people have suggested that it's impossible to talk about is our sense of smell. So Dan Sperber, an anthropologist and philosopher, has suggested that in none of the world's languages is there a classification of smells comparable to, for example, colour classification. And he states that there's no semantic field of smells. And if you look at English or other average European languages, that seems to be true. So we have many different basic colour words and, in fact, secondary colour words, mauve, scarlet. Um, but if we have to talk about smells, we seem to be a bit stuck. So we can refer to objects. We can say something smells like a rose or like soap. Um, and there's words like stinky and fragrant, but they seem to be saying something about our own evaluation of the odour rather than classifying the quality of the odour itself. So based on um, evidence like this, it's been concluded that it's impossible to talk about smells. And maybe smells don't have much cognitive traction for humans after all. But it turns out this generalization isn't true of all languages. One such language is Jahai, which is spoken by a small group of hunter-gatherers in the Malay Peninsula. And the Jahai have around a dozen basic smell words that pick out different qualities of smell. So these are intransitive verbs in the language. They're known by everybody in the community. They're not special register or genre. Even children know them. If you ask people to tell you what smells they are, they'll list them easily. And um, they are common in conversation. So just to give you a flavour of what these smells are, or a taste or a smell of what these smells are, um, there are things like uh, lutput, uh, which are fragrant sorts of smells associated with flowers, soap, um, a bear cat that smells like popcorn for some parts of the season, um, smells like durian, which to Western noses maybe isn't so uh, fragrant, but it is to the jahai. That's uh, distinct from the term pa'us, which is for musty sorts of smells um, associated with some species of hornbill, some species of mushroom, the smell of cabbage, the smell of cooked rice. That's different from pa'i sorts of smells, are bloody sorts of smells associated with fresh meat, some species of fish, otter, toad, and so forth. So these are just three of the dozen or so smell terms in the Jahai language. We tested the Jahai um, for their ability to name odours under experimental conditions. So we took a, a number of Jahai speakers and found age and gender matched English speakers. And we tested them on their ability to name everyday odours and uh, basic colours. And what we found was that English speakers showed high agreement in how they talked about colours, but very low agreement in how they talked about smells. But the Jahai were able to talk about the smells and colours in comparable terms, and they were much better at naming odours than the English speakers. So that shows us that not only is it possible to have a vocabulary for smells, but there can be much uh, there can be differences in the ease of talking about smells under controlled conditions too. Now the Jahai and English speakers differ in all sorts of ways. And one a uh, very um, 
a noticeable way in which they differ, apart from one group are hunter-gatherers living in tropical rainforest and the other um, are more urban dwelling. Um, another salient difference is just the size of the language. So the Jahai uh, speak um, their language with around a thousand other compatriots. So it's a small language, um, what's been called a language of intimates. There's shared knowledge and experience within this community. Whereas English is spoken by around a billion, more than a billion people and probably about half a billion native English speakers. And it's been characterized as a language of strangers. There's a lot of variation within the language community and you find pockets of um, expertise or knowledge that's shared with people that um, share a particular language game. And one uh, such uh, group are wine experts who also hone their palates. So it's different to what the hunter-gatherer Jahai do, but wine experts learn to be able to distinguish the color of a wine. They swirl wines and smell them, and they have to be able to characterize the particular um, odors that they experience. They taste the wine. They have to be able to characterize their taste and then, of course, put all of this together for to form a gestalt of the particular wine. So we wondered whether wine experts might also have cultivated their ability to talk about the smells and tastes of wines. So to test that, we brought wine experts into the lab and compared them to coffee experts and then to lay people who drink wines and coffees but don't have any particular knowledge about them and haven't really learned to talk about them with any particular finesse. So we brought the, um, we gave the wine experts different uh, wines, five different wines that were um, picked to be quite distinct in their palates. We also gave them different types of coffees, five different coffees, and then tested them on everyday odors, common odors like banana, and basic taste, sweet, sour, salty, bitter. And then we looked to see how easily they could talk about the smell and taste of wine, the smell and taste of coffee, these everyday odors and these everyday tastes. And what we find is that wine experts are able to talk about the smells and tastes of wine with greater agreement than coffee experts or novices, but they're no different for the coffees are the everyday smells or everyday tastes. So wine experts have cultivated their noses, but only for the thing that they've specifically trained in. It doesn't generalize to novel odors or common odors even. So altogether, what that tells us is that although the average English speaker may struggle to name smells, this isn't a universal limitation. In different ways, we find that hunter-gatherers and wine experts have cultivated their nose and their tongues or their communication abilities. And that talking about odors reifies the underlying perceptual representations, making imagery much stronger. So overall, to conclude, we find that infants come to the world with rich and complex notions about the world. Nevertheless, on learning the language of their community, certain grooves of thinking become more entrenched and others wither away. Altogether, what it shows us is language and thought are intimately connected. Mm -hmm.